Good day, ladies and gentlemen. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day. Welcome to Advocacy Anywhere, Israel at War, a new series featuring weekly programs surrounding the evolving situation in Israel and Gaza, understanding its impact around the world, and sharing action items you can take from wherever you are. Whether guised as anti-Zionism or expressed blatantly, there's no denying that since October 7th, all corners of the world have seen a dangerous rise in anti-Semitism. Here to help us understand the global impact of this conflict are Agnieszka Markiewicz, Acting Director of AJC, AJC's Shapiro Silverberg Central Europe Office, Dina Siegelvan, Director of AJC's Belfer Institute for Latino and Latin American Affairs, and Mark Sievers, Director of AJC Abu Dhabi, the Sydney Lerner Center for Arab Jewish Understanding. Moderating our conversation today is AJC Chief Policy and Political Affairs Officer, Jason Isaacson. After we hear from our guests, time permitting, we will take your questions. You may email your question to questions at ajc.org, questions is plural, or you can use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Jason, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Claire. Um, it, it did not take long after news broke of the October 7th massacre in Southern Israel, the deadliest attack on Jews in a single day since the Holocaust, for demonstrations to erupt in cities around the world and on college campuses in the United States and elsewhere, condemning Israel for even planning to act in self-defense against Hamas terrorism. And for a chance to be heard calling for the annihilation of Israel and more bluntly and unabashedly for killing Jews. Um, a week and a half after the massacre, I was in Berlin with AJC CEO Ted Deutsch and a few other colleagues, and we heard from Jewish students there their reports of the most chilling anti Semitic calls and signs that were suddenly appearing, including gas the Jews and free Palestine from German guilt. It was horrifying. And I'm grateful that AJC colleagues focused on Central and Eastern Europe and on Latin America and on the Middle East are joining us in this hour to report on the extent of this anti-Semitic surge in the regions that they cover and how Jewish communities are coping with this menace and how governments are responding. I'll ask my colleagues a series of questions and then we'll open the discussion up to you, our viewers. So let me begin uh, with a three-part question that I'll ask to each of our experts. In the countries that you're monitoring, what was the immediate official response to the October 7th Hamas terror attack, terror attacks on Israel? What has been the official response since then to Israel's acts of self-defense, its war against Hamas in the Gaza Strip? And what have been the manifestations of the public's response, both to the massacre and to Israel's actions. And I think I'll begin with you, Agnieszka. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, thank you for having me. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on the time zone that you're in. Um, perhaps because AGC Central Europe covers seven countries, uh, the three Baltic states and the three Visegrad states. Um, and in all of them, the situation is slightly different. Let me start with the easiest and the most pleasant ones in which uh, the support for Israel was really and continues to be um, exceptional and unequivocal um, and just really in some cases, uh, nothing short of amazing. And I'm speaking here about the Czech Republic, about Lithuania, about Latvia, but also Estonia. In the Czech Republic, the level of support for Israel is really incredible, both on the political level from top political leaders, um, but also on the society level. I just spoke uh, today, again, we speak today uh, every day with our representative in Prague, Tomasz Kraus, and I asked him also, um, does he see alongside the, uh, the support for Israel, do they see increase of anti-Semitism? And he said, yes. He said, so normally we would, we would monitor however you count it uh, from 10 to 20 uh, anti-Semitic, not even acts, but, but whatever you can call a month. And now we can see a hundred. So it gives you a scale uh, that is really, really very small um, compared to, to most of the countries that we, that we cover. 
Um, the Czech officials also visited Israel uh, very soon after the horrific attack. Mm, and I would say it is similar in the Baltic countries. Um, the the Latvian president was just uh, was just in Israel. I think he finished he finished his visit uh, yesterday, if I'm correct. And the same goes for for Lithuanian leaders and also for the public um, support of the society. You see beautiful signs of solidarity, lighting candles in front of the city hall in in Vilnius, for instance. Uh, to commemorate or or to bring attention to the to the hostages, but also to commemorate the victims. Now let me let me turn a little bit um, in into places where it's more difficult, and I would focus on Poland as I am Polish and I'm uh, based in Warsaw. Um, the attack happened um, at the very end of a very intensive political uh, time in Poland it, during the election campaign, uh, which was a very heated election. Um, and a very important one. So when the attack happened, of course you could see the official condemnation of Hamas and uh, the government official expressing uh, solidarity with the victims, uh, especially Pres Mr. President Duda. He spoke on the phone with, with the Israeli president uh, Herzog, um, which was of course very meaningful. But I must say that the reaction was very limited among the politician and political leaders. And you could say with almost certainty that it was linked to the election campaign. Um, and which is also a sign that still in Poland, issues connected to Jews and Israel can be perceived as problematic. So during difficult and tough and tight uh, election campaign, uh, you would rather stay out of it. Um, I also have, I think that one of the reasons why the reaction in Poland uh, is not very, very, very vocal um, is, is the fact that Israel, unfortunately, um, is not in the very center of attention. The focus remains on the war in Ukraine. Uh, and while, of course, what's happening in Israel and the war against Hamas is being covered in the media, it is also in the ref with the reference to the war in Ukraine, with the impact that it has uh, on the war in, in Ukraine. As for the support, um, just Sunday, uh, there was the biggest pro-Israeli demonstration taking place in Warsaw. I, can, I think I can say ever, definitely after 89, but there were no pro-Israeli demonstrations in communist Poland before 89. So I can I think you can say ever. Um, it was very moving. Uh, it was not very huge um, compared to other places in the world, but it was very significant. The day before, you also had a pro-Palestinian demonstration, um, which was um, probably similar in size, which was filled with anti-Semitic slogans like from the river to the sea. Um, and what makes it, I think, even more troubling is that in Poland, you don't have a big Arab uh, minority. The demographics are very different than they are in Western Europe, but still you have people who who are motivated enough to participate in such demonstrations. Maybe I'll stop here and let um, my colleagues speak and I'm happy to answer any other questions. Uh, before you go, let me, let me uh, and I turn to, uh, to Dina, um, I yeah. should answer a question about the, whether there have been calls from the countries you cover for an immediate ceasefire, uh, whether there have been those sorts of official reactions, harsh reactions to the military campaign that Israel must execute in Gaza. You know, what, what, what came as a surprise and was widely commented um, was a tweet from the foreign minister of Poland, uh, Zbigniew Rau, who, and it, it wasn't received well, where he tweeted that he met with a delegation of uh, ambassadors from the Arab countries, and he was deeply moved um, by their sense of catastrophe of the situation and of the suffering in Gaza. Um, and because it was not uh, put next to um, expressing similar feelings to the victims, to the Israeli victims, and was not accompanied 
accompanied by giving a context, it was it was pretty negatively uh, received. Um, countries, except for the countries like the Czech Republic, like Lithuania, uh, who 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 are vocally against ceasefires um, and who also show it in their UN uh, votings in U UN, Poland seems to take a position with a distance. And so it's not very vocal about ceasefires, but it's also not very vocal about um, the harmful side effects that we know that such actions can have. Certainly. Thank you, Anishka. Uh, uh, Dina, let me turn to you. Um, the three questions, uh, official reactions to the massacres of October 7th, official reactions to Israel's response to these threats to its security, violations of its security, and then public manifestations. Thank you, Jason, and good to be with you and with Agnieszka and Mark. Um, just as Agnieszka, Latin America, you know, is pretty vast. Uh, I cover many countries uh, in the region, most countries in the region. And of course, there's been differentiated um, responses. What I can say is that um, in general, the Middle East is not an issue that is very prevalent um, in the public square in Latin America in general. Uh, when this type of conflicts come up, we have seen that, you know, it has really brought about, you know, uh, expressions of anti-Semitism, not as virulent as in Europe, I must say. Anti-Semitism in Latin America uh, is uh, much more tapered. Um, you know, there's no violent anti-Semitism. And we'll talk, you know, of course, there's been an increase in anti-Semitism, but I want to put it in, in the right context because, you know, it's not the United States, it's not Europe. Um, but we have seen uh, all kinds of expressions. Immediately after October 7th or on October 7th, most governments, because of the unprecedented nature of the of the crime of what Hamas had been ha, had done, immediately came out in solidarity with Israel and expressed condolences to the Jewish communities and to uh, to Israel. Um, it was across the board. Of course, there were countries that were more nuanced, um, uh, equivocating, whatever. But in general terms, I would say that it was a wave of support and solidarity. Um, but when Israel started defending itself things definitely changed. And we've seen uh, a very clear uh, difference uh, with leftist governments in particular that have been um, you know, tremendously outspoken when it comes to their reaction towards Israel. Um, there's several countries that come to mind. Uh, I have to say that what distinguishes Latin America from other regions is uh, not the uh, violent anti-Semitism, but the fact that you have had more um, uh, vociferous, let's say, uh, and, and uh, very vile um, uh, statements coming from high level political leaders, presidents. Um, that's one thing that I think it distinguishes. And, you know, we've had also breakup of relations and we've had also diplomatic pressure coming in the, uh, in the form of um, recall of ambassadors. Uh, so let me talk about some of them, which I think have stood out and stand out also because they're surprising. The first one is Colombia. Colombia has been a steadfast friend of the United States and of Israel. It's the third recipient of USAID after Egypt and Israel um, and has always been, you know, very um, vocal in its support of Israel and the United States um, in multilateral forums and elsewhere. There's a lot of um, shared interests and, and values. Um, but since the arrival of President Petro, who is a leftist, um, leftist uh, uh, politician, things have changed dramatically. Uh, we saw it on October 8th already. Uh, President Petro started with a tirade, uh, anti-Semitic tirade that has amounted to hundreds of um, tweets um, you know, comparing Gaza to Auschwitz, uh, talking about the international bankers, talking about, you know, uh, global media, supporting those who commit genocide, um, and really, you know, uh, endangering a very strong relationship that has lasted for many decades. Um, so that was, you know, something that really surprised us and concerned us because of the relationship, the close relationship, again, with the United States and with Israel. Then you have Chile. 
You have uh, someone like President Boric, you know, a country that is considered a paragon of human rights. You know, it's uh, it 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 um, it's very proud of of its record in that respect. But when it comes to Israel, you know, there's double standards. And in the case of uh, President Boric, even when he became president uh, more than a year ago, he has not met with the Jewish community. He has, even before becoming president, he said that he was totally pro-Palestinian. Um, and, you know, he had he doesn't even want uh, to see the other side. And this came really to a, um, you know, to its culmination during during this uh, during the the, the Gaza crisis. Uh, President Boric never expressed at the beginning um, condemnation for uh, the uh, for the, the terror undertaken by Hamas. Didn't mention even Hamas, um, and um, and didn't express its condolences to Israel and to the Jewish people. So um, with, with Chile also, it concerns us because as you know, it, they have the largest Palestinian community outside the Middle East, 400,000 Palestinian, mostly Christian, who identify some of, of its leaders, not all of them, but some of its leaders have become very radicalized and identify very much with Hamas. So that concerns us because of the, of course, the implications also for the well-being of the Jewish community, but the Israeli ambassador also has not been treated uh, um, very nicely, you know, even before, but uh, but now particularly. Uh, then we have the case of Honduras. Honduras also has been a very close partner of the United States, relies on remittances from Hondurans living in, in the country um, and receives aid from, from the US. And, um, and we also relied, um, you know, before in multilateral forums for support. Today, there's a leftist leader, uh, Xiomara Castro, who recalled uh, uh, her ambassador, just like President Petro and President Boric, and uh, who, you know, has really distanced herself also uh, in that respect from, from, from Israel and the United States. And then you have Belize and Bolivia, and you will say, Belize, why Belize would, you know, would, would cut relations? Bolivia, we understand because Bolivia is part of the Bolivarian circle with, uh, you know, with with Venezuela and with Nicaragua, with Cuba, um, that there we understand. Uh, and there was a, a small hiatus where it restored relations with 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 Israel, but not anymore. And uh, Belize, you know, relies very much on uh, uh, Jewish and uh, Israeli tourists, uh, but apparently it's very much influenced also by some Palestinian voices that have taken it in another direction. So this is as you can imagine, a brave concern that we're seeing that. On the other hand, you know, you have countries like Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico that are leaders in the region and that have been, you know, have been kind of, uh, Brazil, for example, at the beginning was not, um, you know, President Lula spoke about terror, which was surprising, but now, you know, he has turned around and he's comparing Hamas to what happened on October 7th, uh, um, Gaza to what happened on October 7th, and has been very critical of Israel's uh, performance. We have to say that in, in, in Brazil, you have a large, the largest Lebanese community and Syrian community outside the Middle East. You have huge diasporas there. So this has been, this is also a domestic, an issue of domestic importance. And Mexico as well, you know, President Lopez Obrador has uh, tried to keep uh, distant from uh, from 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 the topic, uh, saying that he's pro peace. But at the same time, uh, in uh, at the United Nations, Mexico has been very very critical of Israel. So it's really a mixed bag. I would say that the uh, expressions of support uh, at the beginning were quite impressive. You had, you know, minutes of uh, silence in parliaments and you had iconic places all over Latin America illuminated in blue and white. Um, and President Lacalle Po, who is a champion really in the region of Israel and, and, and of the Jewish people, you know, um, uh, presented one of the um, kidnapped um, granddaughter of a Uruguayan citizen uh, um, he uh, presented, he gave citizenship to her so she would have a better chance of uh, being freed. Uh, even President uh, Nayib Bukele from El Salvador, who is, you know, an orthodox in so many ways, you know, as a Palestinian, 
said Hamas doesn't represent us, detached uh, completely from, from Hamas and express his um, his his support for Israel. So, you know, it's a very complicated um, landscape. Uh, and as I said, it's a mixed bag, uh, but uh, you know, we, uh, we have to keep on um, making sure that these governments or the governments that we can, not the ideologues, because the ideologues is gonna be very difficult, but others uh, can see, you know, uh, and can help bring the hostages home and can keep on supporting Israel and supporting their Jewish communities, defending their Jewish communities. Dana, thank you. Um, two questions. One, say a little bit more about public expressions, uh, demonstrations and that sort of thing. Um, either you, you talked about the, you know, lighting some buildings up in blue and white and, and, and those sorts of immediate reactions, but those were really probably uh, the government that did that. You know, what kind of public demonstrations are there? And secondly, say we're, another word about Argentina. They just had an election um, with a, uh, person described as a libertarian far-right conspiracy supporter right. but no, an, 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 an anarcho-capitalist anarcho-capitalist very unusual political character yeah where is he on israel where do you expect argentina to be on israel and frankly and, and frankly on the very important argentine uh, jewish community of course uh, well the expressions you know there's been uh um, solidarity marches i would say that mostly by the jewish communities even though you know there's been uh supporters that have joined those marches i haven't seen an outpouring of public support i have to say not even um you know with with the whole issue of the kidnapped um the 240 kidnapped uh jewish communities have put uh, billboards, huge billboards, all over Latin America, um, in shopping malls, in highways, you know, uh, reminding reminding everybody about the need to bring them home. But I haven't seen the outpouring that I would have expected, you know, from, from, from uh, civil society and others. Of course, you have evangelical communities, huge evangelical communities in Latin America, in Guatemala, in Brazil, who have expressed support for, for Israel. Uh, but other than that, I would say that it hasn't been uh, the way we would have liked it. You know, um, We have also seen a lot of uh, Palestinian marches, huge Palestinian marches from Mexico all the way down. Um, surprisingly in Chile, which is a, a case study that it really, you would expect that at this point, the Palestinians would have been even, you know, because of, of of the background, you know that they have been so active in this in this issue that with this with in this context they would have been very very proactive and you know and and uh, undertaking marches and every every day and it hasn't happened like that. And I asked uh, one of our partners why that's the case, and they said that it's because probably Chileans are 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 tired of violence. They have been you know facing violence. Uh, from crime, and maybe that's the case also in many uh, Latin American countries that are riddled by violence, by criminal gangs and everything else. So they are, you know, they 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 just want, they don't want to uh, to build on that, um, on any type of, of, of violent behavior or whatever. And that's why it has been much more calm than we would have expected before. Now with, with, with Argentina, in fact, yes, President Javier Milei was elected yesterday. Um, you know, it's a it's a big change for Argentina that has been governed by uh, peronistas for a long time with a with a small hiatus. It, he has said the right things regarding Israel and uh, and um, and the Jewish people and the United States, um, and uh, even you know throughout his campaign and even before. We have to wait and see how he governs. I think we we cannot jump the gun. We have to wait uh, to see how he governs. But it seems like he's going in the right direction. And if that's the case, he wants to transfer the embassy to Jerusalem. His first trips abroad will be to the United States and to Israel. Um, you know, he studies Torah with a rabbi. Um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a lot of good indicators. On the other hand, you know, we have to wait and see. And um, he uses, by the way, he also uses um, Jewish uh, symbolism. He used the Jewish symbols in his campaign. You know, he would blow the shofar because before he went into on stage. Um, we'll see. 
At the same time, he's in, in his coalition, he has some people that uh, are part of the establishment that we are, that are known quantities. And we hope that, you know, together they will be able to, um, to help Argentina overcome all the challenges ahead. Dina, thank you. I, I never cease to be amazed by the both the breadth of political and cultural sentiments in the region that you cover, and also your intimate knowledge of each of these countries. So thank you for that. Um, Mark, let me turn to you. Um, really the same three questions. Uh, government reactions to October 7th, government reactions to, and, and you and I heard some of these together when we were in the Gulf just a few days ago, um, government reactions to Israel's response to the massacre and and public expressions uh, in the media, but even on the street, to the extent that, that there are street demonstrations in some, some countries in the region. Uh, thanks, Jason. Um, I think uh, just it's important to, to understand that uh, the six countries of the Gulf Cooperation Council uh, are, are all quite different. They may be from a vantage point sitting in the United States. They, they all kind of look the same, um, but they're not. Uh, and they have a quite a range of uh, uh, some actually now have uh, formal diplomatic relations with Israel. Some have uh, uh, various kinds of engagements with Israel. Um, uh, and at least one, uh, Kuwait, has, has no uh, connections uh, at all that, that we know of anyway. Um, so, so there's that as the background. I think I'll start with the countries that uh, are part of the Abraham Accords and where our office is uh, in the UAE and then Bahrain, and then I'll build out a little bit uh, uh, to the others. Um, so the UAE uh, was the uh, worked very closely uh, in, in the Trump administration uh, with Jared Kushner and, and with Netanyahu. Uh, and with others, uh, both in Israel and, and in the United States, to, to get the, uh, the Abraham Accords going. Uh, it was kind of their initiative, uh, and uh, they have full diplomatic relations with Israel uh, and have a very robust, uh, and at least until a month ago, uh, very quickly growing uh, economic ties, uh, both trade and, and investment, uh, a lot of uh, 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 of research and in and, and technology and, and medicine, uh, agriculture, uh, all sorts of things uh, going on there. Uh, and a huge amount, again, until a month ago, of Israeli tourism uh, coming uh, uh, to the UAE, uh, both uh, Dubai and, and Abu Dhabi. Uh, and a, a, um, what started out as quite a warm relationship politically, I think it has gradually uh, become colder over the last year. They didn't like uh, uh, Netanyahu's uh, current uh, coalition, um, not counting the you know the new security cabinet uh, with Benny Gantz and, and, uh, and Eisenkopf, but uh, the cabinet that was the government that was in power on October seventh, they didn't like it, and that created some uh, desire on the part of the Emiratis to keep some distance uh, officially. Uh, from uh, from the Israeli government, and yet uh, all of these other ties uh, continue to move ahead uh, uh, quite uh, briskly. Um, uh, the most of, they did, they were, I believe, the first uh, to express uh, a concern, but their initial statement, I thought, and you and I both saw it, uh, fell short of the mark. It, it just sort of said... Uh, you know, bad things happened in Gaza, uh, didn't really specify the massacres of October 7th. Um, it expressed concern about escalation. Uh, I think they got a lot of, of pushback from, from Israel uh, over that and, and perhaps from others, maybe from Washington, I don't really know. Uh, and they revised it fairly quickly. And by the next day, um, they had condemned uh, Hamas uh, uh, for, I believe, they called barbaric uh, uh, attacks, uh, and they, they clearly uh, identified Hamas as responsible, but they expressed great concern uh, over the potential for escalation. Uh, and as time has gone on, and they are also in the position of uh, 
being the only uh, Arab uh, member of the Security Council. Uh, their term is about to, to end the end of this year, but uh, in that uh, capacity, they represent uh, the Arab uh, uh, states uh, collectively uh, in the UN uh, on the Council. And so they have been very supportive in, on the Council of calls for ceasefire. They've also supported calls for uh, the humanitarian release of, of hostages. Um, uh, but they have not really uh, defended uh, Israel's right to defend itself, not surprisingly, in, in that capacity. Um, so there's a balancing act going on. I think living here, it's very important to understand uh, that we have received, we, the Jewish community, uh, have received multiple messages uh, through various channels, some of them direct from uh, Emirati officials, others indirectly from uh, Westerners who are very well connected, but all conveying the same message uh, that the Emirat, uh, the Emirates uh, is very proud of, uh, uh, of the Jewish community that, that lives and thrives here, uh, that they are watching out for us, uh, that they are, uh, 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 there are mechanisms to uh, uh, raise uh, any concerns about security and that they will take action. Uh, uh, and they have in some cases, um, and uh, and also uh, the Israelis that I know who are here in a business capacity say that there's been no no real impact on on their ability to do business. The profile uh, has gone way down, uh, and I know that the, uh, the Israeli National Security Council I think advised Israeli citizens not to visit anywhere. Uh, in the Arab world, including the UAE. Um, but my understanding is that, you know, the, the Israeli ambassador is still here. The Israeli consul general in Dubai is still here. Their teams are still here. Uh, they are the, the only Israeli diplomatic missions uh, currently in the Arab world uh, that are staffed and, and open. Uh, and that, I think, is uh, an indication of uh, the great confidence uh, that the Israelis have in, in security uh, uh, that the Emiratis are, are able to provide. Uh, and also, I think the, the view of the ambassador here that, uh, that, they, are, that they should remain. Um, so those are very important things. Um, all of that said, uh, uh, social media has been, been awful. Um, uh, official state, you know, television less so, but everybody watches all kinds of, you know, Arab uh, 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 satellite channels. Uh, Jazeera is doing its thing as it always does, and you know, uh, uh, Egyptian television has been terrible. Uh, it's all about, you know, uh, massacre. You know, the vast numbers that they say of, of civilian deaths and and so forth. And if there was sympathy expressed. Uh, for Israeli victims, it didn't last more than a day or two in terms of what's out there um, on the media. Uh, Bahrain uh, is a different society. They have never, so far at least, developed the kinds of business ties that Israel has developed with the UAE. They have never experienced the large numbers of tourists uh, from Israel, although they, they have some uh, before October 7th. Uh, and so there is a, a relationship at the top with the government and with the royal palace, um, but it has not really uh, connected uh, through the society uh, in ways that, that I would say that it, it has uh, uh, here in, in, in the UAE. And they also have um, a very complicated uh, internal uh, situation in which a significant portion of the population, some say the majority, are, are Shia, uh, the, the king and the royal family, and much of the establishment in Bahrain are Sunni uh, and very closely connected with Saudi Arabia. Some, but not all, of the Bahraini Shia identify with Iran uh, and have, uh, if not personal ties with Iran, at least look to Iran as the the leadership of, of the Shia uh, throughout the Gulf and, and throughout the world. Uh, so it's a much more complicated situation uh, 
Uh, we know that there are uh, people who've been outspoken supporters of peace with Israel and Bahrain and of normal relations with Israel who now feel very, very uncomfortable um, and uh, uh, are, are being threatened and so forth on social media. Uh, that's something that is uh, obviously of concern. Um, there is a very, very small Jewish, uh, uh, indigenous Jewish community in, in Bahrain, which they're I'll talk about the Jewish community in UAE is something different. Uh, uh, it's all, it's much larger, but it's all expats. In Bahrain, there are Bahraini Jews. Um, they are there, they're being, uh, they're safe. Uh, but obviously there are, there are concerns about where this is going and, and where, uh, uh, what's on social media and what their neighbors think and so forth. Um, there are really no demonstrations in the UAE. Uh, there is a substantial uh, non-Emirati population here. The Emiratis themselves are less than 15% of, of the resident population in the country. Um, they, I think, uh, Emiratis look to their leadership and have confidence their leadership is, is doing the right thing. Um, but I think there is a substantial uh, resident Arab population here. Uh, many of them Palestinian, also Lebanese, uh, Syrian, uh, it's, uh, fairly diverse, uh, who are uh, very well established here, um, but may never have fully accepted uh, uh, the peace treaty with Israel. They didn't manifest any 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 uh, rejection of it in public, but uh, at home and and in their converse, personal conversations, uh, they may not have been supportive. And now a lot of that is showing up. Uh, on the social media and in in chats and and to some extent in the schools, uh, the international schools. So uh, that's kind of the situation uh, in the UAE and and Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, as I think every pretty much everybody knows, uh, has a uh, uh, been engaged working with uh, the Biden administration. Uh, in a process of uh, working toward normalized relations with Israel. Um, the uh, question of, of what the Palestinians would get out of that package uh, is something that I think wasn't finalized on October 7th, but it was certainly part of the whole mix. Um, and uh, uh, they have, uh, I think, um, frozen the process. Uh, it is uh, my sense, although it's very hard to know for sure, um, that they would like to resume it uh, once uh, the fighting is over and, and once they feel that the, that the, the atmosphere in, in the region uh, allows them to do so. Uh, but it's very hard to know for sure, and it depends on lots of things that we don't know yet, how long the conflict will go on, how it turns out in the end. Um, the extent of the destruction in Gaza, civilian deaths, and all sorts of other things that, that are uh, hard to say. But I think there is still reason to hope that uh, that process uh, will once again move forward in the future, although I can't say that for certain. Qatar has no formal uh, uh, diplomatic ties with Israel, and yet it has had a role uh, in Gaza uh, for many years um, that has off and on been uh, uh, encouraged by the Israeli government, which didn't want to see Gaza collapse entirely economically. It's under uh, a kind of, it's under a, a boycott and a, a very strict uh, regime of uh, inspection of, of goods that come in and out, uh, both from the Israeli side and from the Egyptian side. Uh, but Qatar was kind of this life uh, raft that, that uh, uh, was encouraged, uh, again, off and on by Israel to keep the Gazan economy afloat. Uh, and in, in previous conflicts uh, with Hamas, uh, because uh, Qatar uh, gave refuge and, uh, 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 and very nice living conditions for a number of the Hamas leadership uh, over a number of years uh, in Doha, uh, and they have their own connections uh, to the government and the royal palace, uh, that Qatar has also at times played a mediating role uh, when ceasefires uh, 
and uh, and prisoner exchanges have been negotiated uh, between uh, between Israel and Hamas. So they are uh, very much involved in in this latest effort to uh, to have a humanitarian pause and a release of at least women and children and in some exchange of Palestinian prisoners. All the details are are not yet clear, but the Qataris are very much involved in that. Uh, at the same time, I think there's criticism uh, in in Israel and uh, in some quarters in the U.S. and elsewhere for their hosting of uh, much of the Hamas leadership. And that's a, another factor that uh, uh, may or may not turn out to be positive as this goes on. Uh, Oman, uh, when Sultan Qaboos was alive, uh, had um, channels. Uh, with Israel, it, it actually has a uh, water desalination research project that's been there since the 1990s, uh, something called MEDRIC, the Middle East Desalination Research, uh, something, I forget the rest of the acronym, uh, which has an international board of governors within, on which Israel sits. Uh, and so there uh, usually have been annual meetings of the MEDRIC board in, in Muscat, uh, for many years, and the Israeli uh, Director General for the Middle East and some of their water experts uh, come to those meetings uh, often along with Jordanian and Palestinian delegations. I've been at a couple of those myself when I was ambassador, and they end up yelling at each other, but there is some element of cooperation there that the, uh, that the Omanis have supported for many years. I think most people still remember that Netanyahu was invited to visit uh, Oman in November 2018 uh, as the guest of uh, the Sultan Qaboos. Uh, he came secretly and uh, brought a very high-powered delegation with him, uh, including the head of the Mossad, his military uh, aide. Uh, um, I'm trying to remember, now, no, there may not have been a foreign minister at that point, but his national security advisor. Uh, and of course, his wife Sarah, and they they actually spent the night there, uh, which is uh, quite a, a statement of confidence in in the Omanis that, that they were able to do that. Uh, but nothing really came of it. Unfortunately, uh, Caboose died a little over a year later, uh, and there was no real uh, further development of, of that channel. Uh, and since then, they they have not been engaged. And as I mentioned earlier. Uh, the Kuwaitis are uh, completely uh, 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 opposed to, to any kind of contact with Israel, although I suspect there may actually be some secret channels that nobody talks about. Uh, I'll stop there. Thank you, Mark, uh, for that really very detailed and really comprehensive analysis. Um, and I, I, I'm I'm looking at the clock and I'm realizing that I want to leave time for questions from viewers. So let me just ask, before I do that, one minute responses may be impossible. Some of you cover very large territories. Um, how has Jewish life been affected um, by rising opposition to Israel and also anti-Semitism uh, to the extent that you've, you've, you've perceived that in your regions. And yes, a very short answer is you and, and, and Dina and Mark, I think you've already spoken about this a little bit. So maybe a short answer from you as well, but please uh, start with you on Yes. So um, again, the situation in central Europe is probably slightly different than it is uh, in Western Europe. Uh, again, because of the lack of uh, big uh, Arab or Muslim minorities. So the physical threat is perhaps less present than it is in the Western uh, in the Western countries. Nevertheless, I must say that I just participated in a in a in a meeting with uh, various members of Jewish community, and I was deeply deeply moved by how people are deeply affected. That family histories, especially being in Poland, against the backdrop. Uh, of, of 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 course of living in a country where Holocaust happened, uh, and everything that that makes being Jew a Jew in Poland so complicated, it all comes back. Really, people are horrified. People are traumatized. Uh, people also lose this this sense of security that that you sometimes have in Europe. That if things go wrong, whatever that means, there is always Israel, and of course there is always Israel, um, but they they lose part of their sense of security the jewish community 
is united. The Jewish community does want to show and express their support. There are several meetings um, that's not always the case of, of Jewish organizations meeting together and discussing what can be done. Of course, you also have within the Jewish community, which is not immune to everything that's happening in the wider society, people who, um, who have more views to the left, who sometimes um, tend to pay more attention to what's happening uh, on the other side. Um, and perhaps not be as supportive to Israel as you would imagine, but I would say that it is a margin. So in short, yes, the Jewish community is very much affected, and yes, it wants to act. Thank you, Agnieszka. Dina? Yeah, well, the Jewish communities, as you know, um, Latin American uh, Jewish communities are very Zionistic. Um, I mean, uh, you know, many of the kibbutzim that were affected, there were a lot of Latin Americans uh, more than 30 were kidnapped. More 30 of the kidnapped were Latin, 15 only Argentinians. So there's there's really this passion for Israel that uh, gets um, um, gets even stronger under these circumstances. So you've seen the Jewish communities speak out, um, you know, as I said, march uh, in the streets as much as they can show, you know, their solidarity towards Israel. At the same time, of course, they feel a sense of vulnerability. Uh, but, you know, they started feeling a sense of vulnerability even before. I mean, unfortunately, all of our communities uh, in Latin America have, you know, security measures. You cannot go um, openly, you know, uh, freely to a synagogue. You know, you have, there's there's all kinds of of, of measures to make sure that the community remains safe. Um, and this has to do with anti-Semitism, but it also has to do with, uh, with the context in which these communities live. Um, so at the same time, you know, life continues, continues to thrive. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, as I said, all kinds of activities surrounding um, this latest uh, chapter. Uh, uh, but I would say, and I wanted to say that before, and I have forgotten, that one factor that I think is, is very much in the minds of most of um, the Latin American Jewish communities, especially South Americans, is the presence of Iran. Remember that Argentina was the, the place where two attacks, two terrorist attacks undertaken by Hezbollah uh, happened in 1992 and 1994. The Jewish community remains traumatized. I mean, all of the Latin American Jewish community remains traumatized. And just recently in Brazil, um, the Mossad, together with Brazilian federal police, detained a couple of Hezbollah operatives that were about to undertake, undertake some attacks against uh, uh, Jewish Brazilian institutions. So this is something that is very present. We know that Iran is you know, um, growing its footprint. We know that Hamas is also together with uh, Hezbollah in the tri-border area. And I just wanted to bring this up because this is something that you know, uh, we we're very much aware of and we're following very, very closely. Uh, thank you, Dina. And I know, frankly, you, AJC, has been following that issue for many years. Thank you. Um, Mark, w w when we were together, um, we were hearing that um, Jewish religious services have been disrupted severely by what's happening now. Um, but there are still there are still important communities in Dubai and Abu Dhabi, not huge, but growing. Um, but but uh, it was also good to hear you uh, express the reassurance that we were hearing from the from the Jewish community that the government was keeping a close eye on their security. Yeah, I don't really want to go into too much detail on that in, in this format, but I would just say that while Jews have been advised to keep a lower profile and uh, not attract too much attention, the Jewish life is still alive and well uh, in the UAE, and uh, the message from the government is uh, they want us here, they're happy we're here, and they're looking out for us. Mark, thank you. Uh, Claire, sorry for the long delay. Uh, please, if there are questions from uh, from our viewers. Thanks, Jason, and I'll, I'll try to combine a few given the time. Um, our first is from Rachel Justin in Kansas City. It's a question for everyone, but Agnieszka, we'll start with you. 
Can you talk about the role of youth in the rise of anti-Semitism in your region? Have youth been involved in combating it or have they been fanning the flames? And then a question from Daniel Solomon, specific, specifically for Dina and Mark. We're seeing in university communities, some identity-based organizations such as Latin and Arab student associations entering into coalitions with anti-Israel groups, alienating Latino and Mizrahi Jewish students. How can we respond to this on college campuses amidst other instances of rising anti-Semitism? And again, Agnieszka, we'll start with you. Well, so the role of youth and anti-Semitism, you know, it's it's interesting because when you look at the when you look at the research about the level of anti-Semitism in Poland, it usually concerns most most in most cases the older people and the youngest people. Um, so this is uh, this is a very good question, and you do have usually in Poland you do have uh, more of the traditional anti-Semitism that was was not linked to Israel. Um, and you see, of course, I mean, the short answer to whether AGC Central Europe was involved in combating this, of course, yes, this is part almost of everything that uh, that we do every day. By the way, just over the weekend, we had a we were a partner in a project uh, under which 50 young people from Poland and other countries were going through a deep um, sort of workshops and training anti-discrimination, anti-Semitism. Uh, but also what we start to see more and more among young people, the the new type of anti-Semitism, well, it's not so new for us, but it is new in Poland that is expressed by it's denied for Israel to exist by a very uh, sort of, um, um, yeah, but by standing, pro-Palestinian standing that does not include Israel in the equation. Um, so that is a phenomena that has not been so visible uh, in Poland and across the region um, and starts to be more and more visible. And this is definitely something we are addressing and we're continuing to address. Dina? Yes. Um, we have had, of course, we have young people in the Jewish communities that are very active <clears throat> in pro-Israel activities. And in fact, um, in two weeks, we're gonna have our strategic forum for leaders of Iberian American Jewish communities in Santiago. And we're gonna have a special training for young people from all over the region through AXIS um, that are going to be working on advocacy and other important areas. So of course, young people are, um, are you know, we, we, we want them uh, involved in, you know, they're at the forefront and they're at the forefront in Latin America also because it's a very young continent, um, you know, and uh, I think that it's very important that, you know, they're able to speak to their peers. Um, and I wanted to maybe uh, combine, you know, the other question that was posed to, to Mark and me regarding what's going on in um, uh, college campuses here regarding Latino organization and Latinos. We did a study um, last year, AJC undertook a study uh, regarding um, millennials and Gen Z, their attitudes towards um, among the Latino leaders regarding uh, Israel and anti-Semitism and all kinds of things uh, regarding uh, the subject. And what we what we realized is that, um, that the numbers showed that Latinos are, Latino young people are um, identify more with the Palestinians. Um, they, um, you know, they feel that they're the underdog. Um, you know, they, they, um, they have this um, concept of Jews as white, you know, we know that that concept and they see Latinos as brown. Um, so, so it's that type of narrative that concerns us a great deal and that we know that exists in, on, on college campuses and we have to do much more uh, in order to engage these young people. So, you know, we, we hope that we will be able to undertake a uh, broader uh, programs where we are able to bring to the table uh, young Latino leaders with uh, Jewish leaders and others in order to understand that, you know, identity politics can be on one hand, you know, uh, a, can, can bring this sense of pride, but at the same time can be a source of division and of hate. Um, so that's, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you, Tina. Mark, I, I know that um, AJC has undertaken uh, significant efforts over years to reach out to young people across the region, and we've gathered uh, a number of uh, a number of uh, on a number of occasions um, uh, forums to 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 
encourage exchange of ideas, of perspectives, uh, life experiences, to build friendships, to build trust, um, with the ultimate goal of, uh, down the road, influencing policy as well. Um, I know those contacts continue. Um, I don't know to what extent um, you have a perception of what's happening on university campuses across the region. I don't get the sense that there is that same degree of kind of student activism uh, across the Gulf that, that we see in, in, in Europe and elsewhere. But what, what's your sense of sort of our, our, our perspective on how we can continue to reach out to young people and, and perhaps, you know, build toward a, a next generation that will embrace what's happened on the Abraham Accords? So we have built a, a cohort of, of young people here that we're engaged with, and have, some of them have been on our program. Some of our some come to our events. Uh, it's not a terribly large group, but it's a, a very interesting and diverse group in terms of their backgrounds and their education, even what parts of the Emirates they come from. Um, we are uh, maintaining contacts with with uh, all as many of them as we can, just so they know we're. We're still here. Um, I think uh, this is a difficult moment. Um, and people are under pressure and then a lot of it comes through social media, but it's very important to note that um, they take, there is legislation here uh, that, that uh, criminalizes uh, uh, hate speech uh, and uh, both on, on, on racial and uh, ethnic and religious grounds. You, you can't uh, get away with with uh, uh, anti-Semitic uh, uh, attacks on people if they choose to uh, to complain. Uh, the law is on their side, um, and that's that's very very important um, uh, feature of of the society here. Uh, Bahrain, I th I'm I'm not sure how it works, and it, it's a different uh, situation. Mark, thank you. Uh, but but I but I I hear the continued commitment uh, to uh, to continue this engagement with uh, with young people across the region. Uh, so important to the work that agency yeah. does everywhere in the world, uh, but maybe most especially in that part of the world. Claire, I think we are pretty much at time. Uh, let me uh, turn it back to you. But first, let me also thank Agnieszka and Dina and Mark for giving us this time and, and their thoughts and their commitment to, um, to, to working together with uh, the rest of AJC and with all of our constituencies um, to, uh, to get past this crisis and, and, and move to a better place. Claire? Thank you, Jason, and thank you all for taking part in today's AJC Advocacy Anywhere, and thank you to our global audience for tuning in. To stay up to date on the evolving situation, make sure to follow AJC on social media at AJC Global. You can also find more resources and ways to take action at AJC.org slash Israel Hamas War. Our hearts are in Israel today and every day. I'm Yasser Al-Khai. Thank you and goodbye.